thing the substance is? I don't know. It stops once they've gone through the process or somebody takes something out. Chemicals become too different. They don't react. Something's added. Something's taken away. Not sure. Not sure. No more energy? Um, not sure. Maybe energy or a substance is taken away. Um, more chemicals being added, maybe. Lots of maybes. That's okay. I guess that's all we have. So, any further thoughts on that? Do you stand by what you had to say? Do you have any further thoughts on what causes a chemical reaction to stop? It's okay if you don't. So, from yesterday, I wanted you to go back and review the stoichiometry, look at just basic stoichiometry, level of confidence after you did a few problems. Did it change? So I had lots of twos and threes yesterday. I have more threes and fours today. I think a lot of you I have a few people who are abstaining from voting. They will not give me any information. That's okay. Um, you can be subtle. I don't care how sneaky you are. Um, okay. So I thought you probably needed to refresh a little bit because we had kind of walked away for a few days. And the minute you walk away from a new skill in chemistry for a few days, it gets rusty and creaky and it doesn't want to move anymore. So good, you refreshed. Um, let's take a generic equation. Okay, so we have one of, the, one of the simplest double replacement reactions we can do because it's all balanced as is. Everything here has a, a charge of one, either plus or minus. Great. You all can do the following stoichiometrically. If I tell you I give you 152 grams of sodium chloride, you can tell me how many grams of silver chloride you're going to make, right? We're not going to actually do it, but that's pretty easy. Start with your mass of sodium chloride, get that converted to moles, go through a mole ratio, convert your number of moles of silver chloride, Back out to grams of silver chloride, you got it. Okay, so we know we can do that. If I tell you that I need to make 456 grams of sodium nitrate, you can tell me how many grams of sodium chloride I need, right? So you know you can compare any product and reactant, reactant and product. If I tell you that you made 941 grams of silver chloride, can you tell me how many grams of sodium nitrate were also made? Yeah. You know how to do all of these. You can compare any two things in this equation. So here comes the kicker. You knew there had to be a catch. It's not really a catch, actually. If I tell you that I'm going to give you um, 20, 273 grams of sodium chloride, can you tell me, tell me oops, how many grams of silver nitrate you can react? with that. Yeah, you can. You've just said you can compare any two things in that equation. You have the ability to do I mean, first of all, it's mathematically and chemically possible. Second of all, you have the ability to do it. So if I give you the mass of one of your reactants, you can tell me what mass of the other reactant you can react with that. You can fully react. So now we're going to step away from the math. We haven't really done it yet, but we've hinted at it. We're going to go to the concept of limiting reagents. Let's first talk about this idea. Ideals. An ideal world, a perfect world. You're doing all these calculations. You're telling me, yeah, if you give me 150 grams of sodium chloride, I can make you X number of grams of sodium nitrate. That's because we're assuming that everything goes perfectly. 
we're assuming that the reaction runs completely. If you remember back in um, the lab A5, evidence for a chemical change, you heated the tubes, one group turned charcoal black, everybody else's got varying streaks of darkness in them, and, you know, meh. Some of your reactions didn't run fully. They just didn't. I don't know why they didn't. <laughs> When we do our calculations, we assume that everything's going to run completely. But it doesn't always. So when we're doing those calculations, we're assuming that it's a best case scenario that every single molecule of reactant or every single atom of reactant reacts with every other single atom of reactant that's available and that everything is fully used up. We're starting to hint at what stops reactions doesn't always happen that way. Maybe it's not hot enough, maybe it's not cold enough, maybe your reactants aren't quite as pure as you think they are, uh, maybe the order's a little bit off, who knows? There are lots of reasons. But when we do a stoichiometry problem, we're assuming that everything goes perfectly. And, well, we all know. <laughs> everything doesn't always go perfectly. So now let's talk a little bit about the things that really do stop reactions. When you limit something, you stop it. You know this. There can be one reactant that you put into the mix that there just isn't enough of. So there's one reactant that runs out. And a few of you hinted at this, like all the substances have undergone some kind of change. So when one reactant runs out, the reaction stops. We don't have any more of that stuff to react. So whatever reactant it is that you run out of, that is your limiting reactant. It limits the amount of everything else that can react, and it limits the amount of product you can form. Um, it, it's called the limiting reactant. It's called the limiting reagent. I tend to, to default and say limiting reagent. Same thing. Same thing. So if you run out of one thing... If we go back to our equation, if we run out of one of our reactants, then we have, if we don't run out of both of them, we've got something that's left over. So that is what we call our excess reactant. Okay, so if we have a reactant which is not used up completely, it's called an excess reactant. We have it in excess. Um, we are going to be making soap next week. I think I asked this question already. Has anybody ever made soap? I think you guys said you made it in junior high somewhere or middle school. No? Somebody said that. Okay. We're going to be making soap in here. Soap that you can give as a gift to someone you love. What is soap? Huh? <laughs> it's going to be math, yes. It's going to be the mathiest soap you've ever seen. Okay, so soap is this substance. Soap is actually the product of a chemical reaction between, oops, let me get a color that actually shows up, a fat plus, well, actually, let's be more specific. It's a specialized neutralization reaction between a fatty acid and a base which gets you as products soap and glycerin. Okay, So you have fatty acid, and your fatty acid is fat. You can use olive oil, you can use chicken fat, you can use lard, you can use coconut oil, you can use soybean oil from the grocery store, you can use Crisco. I have made soap with Crisco. Um, you can use any fat you can imagine. Has anyone here ever seen Fight Club? Why are we talking about this? Um, <laughs> if you have not seen Fight Club, I would encourage you to go see it. Um, you know, it's probably yeah. We don't talk about that, um, but you should go see it and think about this. So you can use any fat to make soap. If it's a fat, you can use it to make soap. 
you can mix them all together. You can mix chicken fat and soybean oil and Crisco and make soap. I can't guarantee what it's going to look like, but make soap. Now that base that you use, and we haven't really talked about acids and bases yet. You know that acids are dangerous. You wouldn't go stick your hand in a vessel of hydrochloric acid that we had sitting out. The sodium hydroxide that you used in the ornament lab <clears throat> that many of you wrote in your pre-lab summary, very corrosive. That's a base. It's the opposite of an acid. Um, we'll talk later in the year about how they behave chemically, why they're different. Um, sodium hydroxide is a base. Potassium hydroxide is a base. Usually they're something plus a hydroxide ion. And the one that we'll use in the soap lab is the sodium hydroxide. So can you get, can you rub olive oil on your skin? Will it hurt you? No. Can you rub Crisco on your skin? Will it hurt you? No. We, can you rub chicken fat on your skin? Will it hurt you? No. But dogs may chase you down the street. Um, which, you know, could make your morning more interesting if you're using chicken fat as a moisturizer. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. No problem if your skin comes in contact with one of these fatty acids. Would you rub sodium hydroxide on your skin? No. You would prefer not to. So when we make soap, whoops. When we make soap, one of these two reactants is going to be our limiting reactant. I can move this all up if you would like. So the, li the limiting reactant is the thing you run out of. The excess reactant or excess reagent is the thing that you're going to have left over and there's going to be some lingering when the whole thing is done. You're making a bar of soap for someone you love. In the final product, in that final cake of soap, you can either have some extra oil or you can have some extra sodium hydroxide. Which would you rather wash your face with? The oil. The oil is moisturizing. Um, I used to always, you know, little, little old Italian ladies would use just plain olive oil and little old Greek ladies as a moisture. It's pretty good stuff. I used to use it on my hair. You know, nice, simple, natural, easy. Rubbing some olive oil on your face doesn't hurt you a bit. There's a current fad of putting coconut oil on everything. It will regrow your hair, straighten your teeth, um, unclog your drains, bring world peace. I don't know what it all it will do, but coconut oil is the big thing right now. So can you rub coconut oil on your face? Sure. You can dip yourself in it. You can sleep in a vat of coconut oil as long as you have a breathing tube. Not a problem. So if you have a bar of soap that has some extra oil in it, great, you have a moisturizing soap. If you have a bar of soap that has extra sodium hydroxide in it, what do you have? A booby trap. <laughs> yes. You have a chemical peel is what you have. You have something that's going to basically take off the top layer of your skin. Now people do pay dermatologists to do this, but I don't recommend trying it at home with homemade soap. So if you make soap, which of these two things would you prefer to have be the limiting reactant? The sodium hydroxide. You want this to be limiting. You want the sodium hydroxide to run out. You want to have a little bit of excess fat in your soap. And I'll, I'll tell you this story briefly. My grandma was... She was the first person in her family to graduate from high school. She was this awesome, wonderful, um, strong little old farm lady. And she made soap. When I was a kid, I used to make soap with her. And it was always a summer thing. Grandma would go out in the driveway, and she'd mix up lye. And you, it's gotten harder, but I think you can still buy it some places. You go to the hardware store, and you buy a can of Red Devil lye. It's used as a drain opener. Um, plumber's helper and all those things usually have lye in them. And she'd get a jar of powdered lye, she'd get a big tub, and she'd put the water in, dump the lye in, and she usually did this if she had a big available supply of lard, like something had been butchered, and she would heat the lard up on a little outdoor stove and mix them all together and stir, 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 and pour it, and that was it. And my grandma had not taken chemistry, I can assure you. 
Um, my grandma could not have balanced chemical reaction, and she could not have told you that this was a special category of neutralization reaction between a fatty acid and a base. But she'd been making soap her whole life. She didn't measure much of anything. There was no careful computation. She's kind of, yeah, it looks about right. <laughs> she put it all together. And usually her soap came out great. I have one bar left. I mean, my grandma died 12 years ago. I have one bar of soap left. It's about 30 years old. Um, that was from the last, one of the last batches my grandma made. I found it recently. She didn't do any math. Every now and then, she'd get a batch of soap that she would say, whoo, that's a little bit strong. What had happened? Too much lye, too little fat. In those cases, when grandma had what she called a strong batch, yeah, the fat had been the limiting reagent. And those strong batches went down and got stowed by the washing machine, and she used them on my grandpa's work clothes. They would take out stains. They also weakened the fabric significantly, but it did take out anything. <laughs> so when we make soap next week, you are going to do the math that my grandma never did. And you're going to make darn good and sure that what is the limiting reactant? Sodium hydroxide. Because if you are giving this bar of soap to someone you love as a gift, you don't want to give them a chemical peel accidentally. Here, here's a lovely facial soap I made for you. Oops. Sorry about the skin damage. So. Before we do the calculations for your soap lab, it would be really helpful if we learned how to do the math to figure out what is limiting and what is excess, right? So that's where we're going to start now. Okay, this is kind of the standard form you'll see in these questions. Given, and you'll get some amount of each of your reactants. So here it's given 152 grams of sodium chloride, 237 grams of silver nitrate. Which is limiting? Which is excess? how much remains. So you really have three questions you have to answer. So when you're answering one of these, if you don't have three, you know, three things, boom, 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 that you're answering, you've missed something. So to start out these problems, you pick a reactant. Doesn't matter which one you start with. Absolutely does not matter. I generally start off just going with the first one. And this is your given amount of sodium chloride, 152 grams of sodium chloride. So I'm going to do what we always do with this kind of problem, start a factor label using what? My given. Right. So we're going to start off with 152 grams of NaCl. And what in the end am I trying to figure out? What I'd like to know, really, is how many grams of sodium nitrate that can react. So I'm heading for gram, or sorry, silver nitrate. I'm heading for grams of silver nitrate. So how do I get from grams of sodium chloride to grams of silver nitrate? You got to walk through the valley of the moles. So we know we have to go into moles because we to compare these two things, we have to have a mole ratio. Okay, what's what's our first step? Get it into moles. So to do that, units and chemical here have to be sodium grams of sodium chloride. And up above, since we know we need to go through moles, that's going to have to be moles of sodium chloride. We can put in our values now. What conversion value do we find? Where do we get it? The um, molar mass, yep, 22.99, 35.45, 
Okay, so right now if we stopped, we would be in moles of sodium chloride, but we want to get all the way to grams of silver nitrate. What's our next step? Mole ratio. So units in chemical down here to cancel are moles sodium chloride. Units and chemical up here are moles of silver nitrate. What's our mole ratio? This is why I picked this one. One to one. It's so nice and easy. Everything in this single in this problem is one to one. Now, if we stopped, we'd be in moles of silver nitrate that could be reacted, but we have to go one more step. What do we need to do? Grams. Convert to grams. So, units in chemical down here to cancel. Moles of silver nitrate. Grams. Oops. Of silver nitrate. We need to get the molar mass of silver nitrate. Sixteen times three, fourteen point oh one, and silver is what one oh seven point one oh seven point eight seven. Okay, one hundred and sixty nine point eight eight grams of silver nitrate. Am I getting? Somebody else have a different? Okay, I saw a few crinkled eyebrows. Um, in one mole of silver nitrate. So let's do a quick dimensional analysis check on the units. Grams of sodium chloride cancel, moles of sodium chloride cancel, moles of silver nitrate cancel. I end up in grams of silver nitrate. Is that what I want? Yes. So we know our setup should be good <clears throat> and now we're ready to get a number. Do you have a number that looks like that? Okay. Great! What does it mean? <laughs> What on earth does this mean? <laughs> so, um, here's the challenge with these. You're all good at the basic math of the stoichiometry. The hard part is always knowing what the numbers mean and interpreting them correctly. So I have a trick for that. And the trick is this. So the sentence is, we have blank grams of NaCl, and you're always starting the sentence off with whatever was in that first position, whatever you started your factor label with. So we have 152 grams of NaCl, which could react this many grams of silver nitrate, which could react 442 grams of silver nitrate. That's after we take sig figs. But we, and here it's going to either be we have or we only have. And you have to go back to your original problem. If we go back to the original problem, we see that we were given how many grams of silver nitrate? 237 grams of silver nitrate. So we only have 237 grams of silver nitrate. So we, and the options are one of two things. We either run out of silver nitrate or we have some number of grams left over. Which is it? Who says we have some number of grams of silver nitrate left over? Who says we run out of silver nitrate? Who is too chicken to commit to a position? Bark, 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 bark. That's okay. That's okay. We're just starting. We run out of silver nitrate. So we could react 442 grams. But we only have 237 grams. So we're going to run out of silver nitrate before all the sodium chloride is reacted. The way to think about this is <clears throat> um, in terms of money. There are 10 pizzas for 10 bucks each. You could buy 10 pizzas and spend $100, but I only have $15. I run out of dollars. 
So if the amount that you could react is larger than the amount that you were given, you're running out. In this case, which is your limiting reactant? Silver nitrate, because that's what you're running out of. This stuff is easy conceptually and easy mathematically, and it's hard putting the concept with the math and interpreting it correctly. So let's, yes, questions. You should have questions at this point. Sure. Which part? All of it? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to start off with just reading the sentence. Do not feel patronized. We have 152 grams of sodium chloride, which could fully react 442 grams of silver nitrate, but we only have 237 grams of silver nitrate. So we run out, and I'll, I'll even add to that, we run out of silver nitrate. Okay. How did you know that we Because I have to go back to my original problem where it says I was given 152 grams of sodium chloride and 237 grams of um, <coughs> silver nitrate. So for that, you always have to look back to the original problem. Okay, so because we're running out of silver nitrate, silver nitrate is the limiting reactant. So let's do a couple of things. If it runs out, it's limiting. If it runs out, it is limiting. So we know that silver nitrate is our limiting. We said there were three questions here. Which is limiting? Which is excess? How much remains? We have answered one of them. Here's a, a lovely little trick question if you had a really mean chemistry teacher. Maybe you do. I don't know. Um, how much of your limiting reactant is left over? None! <laughs> yeah, you run out of it. There's none left over. There is never any limiting reactant left over. So we know that the limiting reactant is NO3. What's the excess reactant? This part you've already answered because there are only two reactants. Sodium, the, um, sodium chloride is going to be your excess. So you've answered two of the three questions. If you only have two reactants, whatever is not limiting has to be excess. Now, we happened to get unlucky. Remember I said, you don't, there's no particular order you have to compare these things in. You can start your first factor label with either reactant and you'll figure out which is limiting and which is excess. We figured out which was limiting and which is excess. What we haven't figured out is how much of the excess reactant is left over. And to do that, we have to do a second factor label. Okay. <clears throat> so to figure out how much of our excess we have left, we have to start a factor label that asks the question, when we react all of our limiting, how much of our other reactant can we use up? So we're now going to start a factor label with our limiting, which is our AgNO3, our silver nitrate. Okay, so now the question we're asking is, the 273 grams of sodium nitrate, we know every single gram of sodium nitrate will react, again, under ideal stoichiometric conditions. How many grams of sodium chloride can we use up with that? So we're doing the same kind of factor label we did, only backwards. 
units and chemical have to cancel. Grams, silver nitrate, moles, silver nitrate, because to compare those two chemicals, of course, will have to be in a mole ratio. Then we can get to our mole ratio, moles, silver nitrate to moles, sodium chloride, and at that point, we can do our final conversion from moles of sodium chloride to grams of sodium chloride. So now we just have to plug in some values. We already looked up, we already calculated all of these molar masses. And typically, when I get a limiting and excess problem, the very first thing I do is I just calculate the molar masses for both reactants, because I know I'm going to use both of them a couple of times. So one mole of sodium nitrate was how much? So we have 169.88 is the molar mass of sodium nitrate. The mole ratio is 1 to 1. I picked this one because it's nice and easy. It's clean. And one mole of sodium chloride is 58.44 grams, correct? Anybody else get a raw number that looks like this? 93.914? No? Did I screw something up? I might have screwed something up. I see lots of people going, you know what I did? I reversed my numbers. I put 273 instead of 237. Sorry. Okay, so we get 80, sorry about that, 81.52, etc. grams of sodium chloride. Again, what does this mean? And we can use the same exact sentence that we used on the other page to figure out how much sodium chloride. And for some of you, you're going to see this intuitively and obviously, and you're going to go, oh, okay, bing, I got it, I'm done. But if you tend to get wrapped around the axle with this, writing that sentence really helps. I'm going to actually give you a sheet of paper that has that sentence on it, just that sentence. I'll post it on Classroom, and I'll, I'll have a physical copy for you. Um, so let's try the sentence. Um, I will have, wait, I will have the sentence sheet on Classroom. I'll also put on PB Works in Classroom a list of new problems from the review that are assigned because I do want you to look at at least one of those on your own. We're going to keep working on this tomorrow. Have a good day, folks. Okay, so the sentence would go then 273 grams of sodium nitrate could react 81.5 grams of sodium chloride, but we have 152 grams of sodium chloride. We get that from going back to the original problem. So if we take the amount we could react and subtract it from the amount we were given, we have, and that turns out to be 70.5 grams left over. And that gives us the answer to the third part, which is 70.5 grams sodium chloride remain. Hey, okay, we'll pick it up tomorrow.